There, yeah, 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 there we go. Now we're cooking with grease. All right. And then like cooking with a little lard. <laughs> All right, Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for your blessing upon your word. You promised that you would always bless your word. And I just thank you, Lord, for the hope that you grant us according to the scriptures. And we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. As I've been reading in these Proverbs, and Lynn and I were talking a little bit today, and it, it is kind of amazing. You think of the, the wisdom that's in here, and then it's easier to, I would rather gain wisdom by learning from somebody else's failures rather than doing my failures and gaining that wisdom and understanding that way. I'd rather look and go, okay, I don't want to do that. And in high school, I made my own mistakes, and uh, I wasn't living it out loud as I needed to, especially my sophomore year. But then I, I can remember growing up around in the, in the construction world, there were things that I, I saw people doing, and I said, I don't want to do that. You know, you'd see it, and you go, that's really dumb. And so it was good in a way being raised by the, the pack of, whatever you want to call them that I was raised by out there on the job because you go, man, I'm not going to do this. I, I just don't, it doesn't make any sense. But most of them would get their paycheck on Friday and then want to borrow money to get to work on Monday. And because I'm like, and it wasn't because, I mean, because they, they're boozing it up all weekend and they come in with a hangover on Monday and I don't have enough money to get to work this week. So you'd have to forward them a check in order to get them on the job. And so I was like, man, you guys are knuckleheads. But so when we're looking at wisdom, it's better to see wisdom being played out and you get and ask for that wisdom, but watch what other people are going through, what they've seen, uh, learn from it. I mean, somebody that, and, and the worst thing we can do is go through our experiences and make up our theology as we go because of those experiences. We take all of our experiences to the Word and say, God, give me wisdom how I can avoid this next time. Because when I talk to like cops and stuff, the way they deal with, they have a fatalistic view of life at times because they have to deal with a lot of death. And, and some of it, you just don't have answers for it. So you just, the way they, they answer it is it was just their time. Now, that works in some places, but, and, and some, or they'll just say, these guys are knuckleheads, they shouldn't have been doing that, and they, they're, they made that decision, which is probably right on that, but the fatalistic view of it's just their time. It doesn't work with suicide, doesn't work with drug overdose, doesn't work with, you know, because just, that doesn't play out in my mind, you know, and people that want to hold to that, you take the unexplainable and you build a, 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 a theology around it. Sometimes you can explain it. Sometimes that when I go back, and let me just use my tragedies that I go out on. Uh, when I go back, after I get through with the scene, a lot of times I'll go back to the 911 dispatch. And I'll tell them and fill in pieces and parts of what happened. Because all they do is dispatch and get people there. They don't always hear the end result. And then they have to move on to the next call, whatever the next call is. And while we're dealing on the scene with all this stuff. So I try to go back and fill in pieces and parts and why this happened or what was going on, especially like if you have an 11-year-old suicide. We had one over not too far from here in North Shelby. It wasn't the one the hanging, but it was a little boy shot himself. And I listen when I'm on those scenes just to kind of collect in my mind what happened here. Why? What was going on in this child's life that they thought that they needed to end their life or the things that were happening, peripheral stuff. And sometimes there's nothing. I mean, it just, it just bum fuzzles everybody. But then there are other times you just kind of go, well, that makes sense. That connects dots right here. And, but I don't want to build a theology around tragedies. You know, it's, even Jesus said, you know, talking about the tower that fell on the people, he said, were they worse sinners? Not necessarily. Sometimes I walk away from these things just saying we live in a fallen world. I, one day will make sense of it. Those people in Lahaina that had to jump in the ocean to get away from the fire, and some didn't even get out of the car before that fire consumed them. And, they, and I was like, they don't make them any worse than anybody else. So free will choices are there. Um, but I want to learn, especially that's what I, I guess I started with, the free will choices. 
people that make decisions, you know, I want to walk in wisdom and figure out, okay, how can I avoid this setting, this situation? Um, not to live in fear of something or things like that, but if I can make a wise decision by looking and saying, well, that wasn't too smart for that situation, you know, I, I think we need to do that. So looking at Proverbs 8, I'm going to read through this and some of it and say, does not wisdom call out, does not understanding raise her voice on the heights along the way where her paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gates leading into the city at the entrances, she cries aloud. To you, O man, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple gain prudence. You who are foolish gain understanding. Watch and see. See these things that are happening. Listen, for I am worthy, I have worthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true. My lips detest wickedness. I was listening to a preacher this past week. You can listen to him if you want to. Bodhi Buchanan. Is that, what is it? Yeah, Bauckham. I was listening to some of his. And, you know, he is, he's a wise man. He's a black man. He's a wise, wise guy. I mean, he's, he's got, he's full of wisdom on his teaching. And, and so as I was listening to him, I was, I was kind of going, there's, there's some understanding here that we need to get. And, you know, he was, he was going through in this one, one of the sermons, because all the stuff we're dealing with in our church, one of his sermons was Genesis 19, and it was Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> it was like one of those lights that go off in my mind, because he did say this. He said, you know, when Lot offered his daughters, who were virgins, to the men who were wicked, because everybody today in the theology of, of the homosexual be accepted, they're saying these were just wickedness. They weren't homosexuality. No, it was homosexuality, totally. And, and yes, they were vile and they were wicked. That was what it's described. But they wanted the angels to have relations with and to, to know them in the biblical sense, is what it says. But he said, he was, Lot was wrong when he offered his daughters, but can you imagine more? They would say that he offered his virgin daughters. There's not a more safer city for them to be in to keep their virginity than that city right there because they wasn't a man. They're interested in them. And I thought, yeah, that makes sense, you know. He said, because that just, they didn't have to worry about it, you know. But at the same time, they refused that, and they still wanted the strangers. But he was preaching through that, and that was one of the things that kind of went, yeah, that does make sense. I didn't like, you know, Lot's response of trying to protect the angels and that kind of thing was just off. And the angels just struck them all blind, and that was good. But one of the other things he was talking about, and, and the reason I say it, I said, listen, I have worthy things to say. I open my lips, speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true. My lips detest wickedness. Years ago, y'all remember when AIDS first came out in the homosexual community, and one of the political things they had to do was distance the homosexual, the AIDS virus from the homosexual community. And they had to distance it in a bunch of different ways politically. Because I think, uh, I forget who it was, one of the preachers came out and said, yes, it's judgment upon homosexuality. That was just unheard of. That was like mean and everything else. There are judgments that come upon certain things. God will give judgments out. Even, he doesn't wait till the last day, there are certain judgments come out. And that goes with any aspect of, of you know, when God tells us, and I'll, and I'll go as far as this, when God tells us not to worry, he means it. He knows the destruction it can bring upon our lives. Just worry alone. He knows that if you walk in wickedness, I mean, we've got diseases now that, we can't cure. I mean, we got stuff that are sexually transmitted diseases that we have no cure for whatsoever. Wickedness seems to abound, but it's, wisdom's call it says, my mouth speaks what is true. For those that are, that are older, you remember uh, the, all the campaign, it was a, pretty much in the church of, of wait, of waiting in sexual purity. I mean, that was it. And it's still here. Hopefully we still preach that, but and, and in the world, they looked at it and says, no, you got to prepare them for the activity and you got to do this. And, and it's like, but the Bible tells us that wisdom speaks what is true and it tests wickedness and there's right and there's wrong. There are absolutes in this world. Wisdom will speak that. It said, all the words of our mouth are just. None of them are crooked or perverse. People that are trying today to twist scriptures are testing God and they're putting things 
you know, I, I said something to Cheryl, and she's in there cooking tonight, and yeah, I think we've lost our biblical mind in the church in a lot of ways, in the way that we're trying to justify everything. And he says, none of them are crooked or perverse. None of the words of wisdom. He said, the discerning, all of them are right. They are faultless to those who have knowledge. I said this years ago, and there was something that um, I don't believe an immoral judge can judge justly. I just don't. That's why it's important their lives line up also. If you have immorality in that judge's life, it will show and taint on his judgments. It always does. It's kind of like the preacher that tries to preach on sin who has got unrepented sin in his life. You know, he's always afraid that that one's going to come in. Yeah, that's right, preacher, you know, and expose him. That's what happens in the liberal mindset. Things start going that way. Instead of repentance, instead of preaching repentance, instead of experiencing repentance, a lot of times, and I can say this on behalf of preachers, we preach an easier gospel to cover our own selves. Because the gospel's not easy. It's not, it's not convenient, nor is it easy. So when wisdom is speaking, he says, to the discerning, all of them are right, to the faultless, to those who have knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver, choice. Uh, knowledge rather than choice gold. He said, for wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you can desire can compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. Now, anybody know prudence? <laughs> That's discretion. <laughs> it's, I, prudence is not a name we use anymore. Um, but wisdom and prudence dwell together. I possess knowledge and discretion. It says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Now, we go back to where we went through the Fear of the Lord series. It is to despise evil. And then he goes on, the wisdom says, I hate pride and arrogance. Have you ever tried to teach somebody that's prideful or somebody that's arrogant that's got all the answers? There's nothing worse. I mean, you, says, you, gotta, you just got to throw your hands up. And I had a young man pull me aside this week, and he said he was, uh, I mean, he didn't have his life together whatsoever, but he's had some just things that happen. I mean, it's like pow, 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 and financially. And he has always prided himself with all of his finances. Drives the nice cars, has all the nice stuff, all this thing. But everything in his life is out of order. When he pulled me aside, he says, you know, I had a, a preacher tell me the other day, because his girlfriend's working at this place and making some money, and he said, this preacher asked me, he said, do you tithe? And he's like, No. And, he, and once he got that explained to him, he was like, maybe that'll help me. But I mean, it's, it's a bunch of things he's going to get in order in his life because disorder is pride and arrogance in our lives. When God declares something, he said, this is the way I want you to walk, walk you in it. That's the way you need to walk. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. reason why he hates those things is because they are... Pride and arrogance, especially, build himself as self-sufficient against God. And uh, the, the person that is self-made, that's made is boo koodles and boo koodles of money, never has any thanks to God whatsoever, then most of the time it's pride and arrogance. They're going to find themselves, they fall flat one day. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have understanding and power. By me, kings reign and rulers make laws that are just. This goes back to a while ago. If you are, you know, I, and I think in the past we've seen it, um, I think the Roe v. Wade, you go back on it, and that was an unjust ruling. It just wasn't because even the lady, Jane Roe, the one that represented it in there, even she came out and said there was not truth in that, in the way she represented it. And the whole thing was built on an untruth, a law that dominated for so long, and then when it was overturned, it was like that was been, we all kind of look back on and go, because, I mean, the justices now said that ruling was wrong. Um, but it takes the conservatives who want to stay with the constitutional premises instead of whatever the winds of the culture is blowing. He said, by me, princes govern all the nobles who rule on earth. I love those who love me. Those who seek me, find me. With me, riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. He said, 
Um, my fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the path of justice, bestowing wealth on those who love me and making their treasuries full. I, and I was looking at this, and I, was, and I, I walk in the way of righteousness. I don't think maybe I know there's a few politicians I would trust and say they, they got it right. I think our, our representatives from our area are good. Um, I think they have a righteous view and biblical view of things. I've spoken to them publicly and, and privately and stuff, and I find them to have that righteousness to them. Um, but I look at what is happening in our justice system right now. Um, whether you like Donald Trump or not, I mean, you you say, well, he did this, he did that. I know that. But every time Biden's son gets found out about something, another charge goes against Donald Trump. It just, it happens that way. I think we're weaponizing, and it can happen to the Republicans, it can happen to the Democrats. If you weaponize the justice system, then this nation will go, will start groaning. And that's what's happening now. I get... I get to thinking about it because when I think about the 80,000 IRS people they've hired that will come and take your house, your car, and your dog away, but then they'll take and give $300 billion to fight over in Ukraine to filter it back here to our politicians. And that's a provable trail. And you're kind of going, what is wrong with this picture? You know, would Americans come last? And so anyway, I'm on a rant. I do think righteousness, wisdom walks in the path of righteousness along the paths of justice. The critical, what is that, critical race theories is trying to get to justice in a whole other way. I don't think you can do reparations. That's not justice. I, I don't, that is, that is a horrible idea. One of the problems that we've run into in our, our political system is that we, we make the poor lame to where they do not want, and they don't have, we take the incentive out. When you take the, and I'm not talking about just one community, but when you take the dad out of the family, the government becomes dad, you got a problem. That's not wisdom. That's not justice. And then you got to sit, and, and the problem is we compound things with different solutions. I have no idea, and I know I'm ranting on a few things, I have no idea how we're going to get um, groceries. I was thinking about this day. How are we going to get groceries to the grocery store without diesel? <laughs> you know? Well, m the climate change people, they don't care. They want justice for the climate. They'd just seem for you to starve to death so that this world will keep spinning in their view. And I'm going, it's crazy stuff we're dealing with. People aren't walking in wisdom. They're walking in whatever the animation of their mind is right now, and you're going, what is that? What is going on? I think, yeah, there's a lot of fear in all of it. And, um, and another thing that Bodie brought out was, and I hadn't really thought about it, but you go back in Genesis, and one of the things that he did bring out was one of those aha moments. He said that, you go back to the curse where he cursed Eve, he said, also he cursed Satan he said he will always be after your seed you know what is the the mantra in the liberal world is to kill babies under the choice kill babies and then what's another way you can keep from having reproduction in this world same-sex marriage <laughs> it's I mean anything Satan can do to stop the seed because that's that was a part of the curse, and that's part of where Adam and Eve, when they were cursed, and it said that I'll read it to you. Here. It said, "Curse the ground because you'll be painful in birth, and it, painful tool to eat." And then, it, as he goes through it all, he said, "Curse to you above all livestock and wild animals. You'll crawl on your belly. You'll eat the dust the days of your life. And I'll put him between you and the woman, between your offspring, and it will crush your head and you strike your heel." And then he tells the woman, "He said, I'll greatly increase the pains of your proud birth." And it, the, the seed is what he's after in all this. But part of it was the seed being Christ. That's why he killed off the babies during that time. But I still think because we're made in the image of God, 
part of that, what the enemy is after, as always, is that seed. It goes on in here, and it says that we choose that. It said, the Lord brought me out forth in his first works. And when it was nothing but chaos, he spoke, wisdom was there. He said, for the deeds of old. So I was appointed from the eternity, from the beginning, from the world began. Where, when there was no oceans, I was given birth. Where there was no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled in place. Before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the earth or its fields or any of the dust of the world, I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon of the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundaries so the waters would not overstep his command. Now, it's funny when you read that and you think of climate change and all the stuff that we're fearing and we're saying that we can all drown and New York City is going to be, you know, this, that, or the other. And I'm sitting there going, he promised never going to flood the earth again. And then he says also he keeps them, there's, there's a boundary. Now, as the ocean levels change, sure, there are things that have changed. Is some of the real estate in California washed into the ocean? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's all there. But he goes on to say he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was a craftsman at his side. I was filled with delight day after day. Rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in the whole world and delighting in mankind. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to my instructions. Be wise. Do not ignore them, nor it. Blessed is a man who listens to me, watch, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. For whoever finds me finds life and receives favor from the Lord. So that's something that we cry out for is give us that wisdom. God, we find favor with God. Whoever fails to find me harms himself. Whoever hates me loves death. A lot within that saying, hey, seeking after what I was there, when God said to light, let there be light. When the worlds were created, when the oceans were set, when all that was there, wisdom was right there. And so we find that if God says, if you need wisdom, you ask for it. Now, I believe he grants the wisdom because if we live in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit works within the parameters of God's, everything about God. He is to reveal God to us, reveal his plans, his purposes. So when we read scripture, like even right now, we're reading this scripture, it should quicken in our hearts. And a part of that is when he says, my sons, listen to me, blessed are those who keep my ways. To understand the ways of wisdom, God is wanting us to have that. And it said, listen to my instruction. Be wise. Do not ignore. A lot of times, I've, young people especially, we watch them. And, and if, if anything, and that's why I tell these college graduates, these high school graduates going off to college, college is not real. <laughs> it's not a real world. I don't care how much you think it is. It is not. You're all going to have to live one day on your own, and you're going to have to make money. You're going to have to do all these things. College is this little four-year, hopefully you'll get an education. But it shouldn't be a four-year party. It's not a real. You will pay the consequences if it becomes that. And so I try to tell young people when they're going to college, that use wisdom. You know, look at these knuckleheads that are doing what they're doing, going, I don't want to do that. You know, there was a lot of things I saw when I was at college. I was like, well, that's, that's going to come back and bite you later, you know. And that was not a wise thing, you know, four years later. Then he goes on in the ninth verse, says, wisdom has built her house. She's hewn out seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She's also set her table. She has sent out her maids, and she calls from the highest point of the city. Let all her simple come in. Say to those who lack judgment, come and eat and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways, and you will live. Walk in the, in the way of understanding. Here it is, pleading with you. Whoever corrects a mocker invites insult. You ever done that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like that girl at night getting in that fifty to $60,000 Jeep. And looking at me like I got white privilege when I'm standing with the cops and the Galleria protest and all that stuff. What are you looking at? I was like, I'm looking at a spoiled rich kid getting into a sixty, seventy thousand dollar Jeep who's thinking that she's getting justice out here on the sidewalk. And I'm going, There's something wrong with this picture. Whoever I don't try to correct her, just looking at her going, Not much, whatever. Whoever corrects a mocker invites insult. Whoever rebukes a wicked man incurs incurs abuse. If someone is not ready, it's like casting your pearls for a swine. You can sit there and go, 
you know, this is not a very wise decision you're doing, you know. Um, you know, the, the, until you have been burned or know somebody has been burned by signing on with somebody on a loan, <laughs> you go, because, I mean, you have all great intention. Yeah, I'll, I'll co-sign with you. And it might not even be blood. But then when they, then you start watching their lifestyle. Okay, you, you can't make payments this month. Now I got to make payments. You've been out, going out to lunch every day. You've been doing this. You've been, you start questioning, even a friend, you start questioning their lifestyle. That's why I say never co-sign, you know, not unless you're willing to pay for it. Did you? Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, I had an opportunity. I was like, it just, I've had people ask me that before, and I was like, I, I don't co-sign. I do not. If I don't want to buy you a car or I don't want to buy you a house, I can't co-sign because I got to pay for it, whatever it is. The Bible tells me not to do that. It said, leave your simple ways. It said, whoever, it says, do not rebuke a mocker. He'll hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Is that true? I think so. A wise man, why? Because a wise man walks in humility, not arrogance. If you can go to a person that's wise saying, you know, what you just did there is not going to work. And they'll go, okay, tell me what's better. Boom. Then you can, you'll find that. But if they, and, and sometimes all of us, we do it. I don't think that. I'll, I'm going to go. And then, I'll, then that's when the Holy Spirit takes over and says, no, that was, listen to that rebuke. That was a good rebuke. Um, because God's always there. He says, rebuke a mocker, he'll hate you. Rebuke a wise man, he'll love you. Instruct a wise man and he'll be wiser still. Teach a righteous man, and he will add to his learning. I agree with that. You teach one a person that is walking in humility, and that's righteousness. You'll find that they are like a sponge. They want to know. They want to know the why twos, what twos, and every other two, because they don't want someone just to say, "Hey," and even just not even being spoon fed. They want to know the whys. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Put that one on your refrigerator because the fear of the Lord truly is the beginning of wisdom. Understanding that he is in charge. He is not changing. He is not lying to us. He does not shift with the shadows. He is always going to be God. The fear of the Lord, knowing who he is, is that beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of him gives us understanding. For through me, your days will be many. Your years will be added to your life. I've known people that, that have probably... Because they've rejected wisdom, they've rejected understanding, they will shorten their lives. And that's what we're talking about, started out with the fatalism. I believe you can hasten your days. Um, something simple, just take the alcoholic. How many of y'all have ever had somebody that's an alcoholic, and you tell them, you're going to die if you don't quit? Well, it's not God's will for them to drink themselves to death, I can tell you that. And God is always faithful to bring people across your path when you're walking in blatant error. Have you always had somebody do that? No one. I mean, you've walked in blatant error, and somebody came to you and loved you enough to say, boom. And if you're wise, and if you want that, you'll receive it with humility. I've, I've talked to alcoholics before, and I said, look, you're an alcoholic, dude. You gotta, you're, you're dying. Your, your eyes are yellow. Your skin's yellow. Your liver's shutting down. And you're going to die before you even get to be 55 years old. Nah. Nah. Ain't got no problem. I ain't got no problem. We can lengthen our lives if we have wisdom. I said, if you are wise, wisdom will reward you. If you're a mocker, you alone will suffer. I think others suffer with you, but you will suffer if you're a mocker. The woman folly is loud. She is undisciplined and without knowledge. She sits at the door of her house on a seat at the highest point of the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Let all who are simple come in here, she says to those who lack judgment. Speaks of the loud prostitute, but the folly is that. She cries out to those that are walking a certain way. Come, come to me. Come be a part of what I'm doing here. If y'all have friends that got off track, What's the first thing they want you to do? Come on. Come on. I, it, hadn't, it hadn't hurt me. I'm having a blast. 
you know, and you sit there, and, and I wish we could fast forward, you know, a good 10 years. You can say, but this might not hurt this moment, but 10 years from now, it can hurt you. I think it was, it was Bill Gothard years ago by that he talked about the mistakes. That's why he did basic youth conflict seminar. Because the mistakes we make in our teenage years will follow us at times. Stuff that we do, it can follow us. Attitudes, actions, and things we do, they can follow us. You go on into your 20s, there are things that you can do that will follow you. I, I've just, I can't tell you how many times that we get to the end of our life and then we start looking back with regrets and folly called out to us at a moment of our weakness and says, come, come to me. Um, but I'll tell you this, and it's kind of like if you go back and look at Joseph, who was caught Potiphar's wife there, and she tried to get him. Uh, she cried out to him. She wanted him, but he ran. Got in trouble, left, left his cloak. But you find that wisdom calls out in every situation. Folly also calls out, but it's who our ears are going to be attuned to. The Bible tells us in John, it says, my sheep know my voice. His sheep know wisdom's voice. Have you ever been in those crossroads where, let's just say a job decision, and you go, I, have, I need wisdom here. I cry out and ask God for wisdom. Then you make a decision, and when you walk through that decision you made, you go, this isn't right. You got to hurry to get out of it because you know Holy Spirit, because it looked right, it set up right, it was, it, it, everything was, you know, I was making more money, I was doing this, I was doing that, and, and then you get there and you go on, everything on the inside of you says no, and the Holy Spirit says no. So wisdom is always crying out, along with folly will never leave us alone. It always invites us to destruction. Even when we, get, that's why it says gain wisdom, Continue to gain wisdom. Walk in humility. Fear the Lord. That keeps us from making that decision to follow after folly. Said, so let all those that are sinful come in here and say that. I got to sneeze, sorry. <coughs> Said, stolen water is sweet. Food eaten in secret is delicious. But little do they know that they are, that the dead are there and their guests are in the depths of the grave. If we choose sin, which is what Folly's asking us to go to, we're choosing against the wisdom, especially for a believer. We're choosing against the wisdom of God. And God says, listen, I, I'm giving you the wisdom. I'm telling you this way to walk, the paths of righteousness, walk in this direction. And Folly's always saying, come on, this is a better idea. This is a better plan. I can, you can have more fun here. Um, or I can get you to your end result quicker. Um, I don't know how many preachers' downfall has been to try to subvert God and get to that place that we dream of quicker. And God says, I'm, I'm not interested in getting you. Because there, I, I don't know, I dreamt about it as a young man of preaching for thousands and doing the da 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 and all this stuff and traveling. And, but I know this, I'm where I'm supposed to be. And God's taken me through a lot of, Let's say the winners of your soul, because you go through that. And it's been good when you go through the winner of your soul, because you have to reevaluate what truly is important. And walking after wisdom, following wisdom, is what's truly important. I don't want to end up in the place of the dead. I want to stop here because I don't want to go into 10 this week. Um, but I don't want to end up in the place of the dead. And that can be a spiritually in a place of the dead, not just in that place where. You go, you know, I don't want to die physically. But there are folks that make decisions that affect their spiritual. It weighs heavy on their soul. And the quickest, easiest way to get back to the place you're supposed to be is through that, that dastardly word called repentance. And say, God, I have listened to folly. I need to get back to you. Give me wisdom. Um. Sometimes it is to go make recompense, to go make things right if you can. Um, but most of the time it's coming to God saying, God, I, I, I want to hear your voice clearly. When we're not hearing his voice, usually we can look back 
to a, it's a small fork in the road of our lives. And you can go back there and say, okay. And you ask God, where's, give me wisdom. What happened here? What's not right? And he'll tell you. He'll say, you're not spending enough time with me here. You're not doing this here. And usually it's somewhere that the road fork, busyness got you. I don't know if business gets anybody else, but it gets me. Busyness got you. And you kind of start following your own way. Busyness is, can be folly because you disconnect from God. And you become, your, your busyness becomes your taskmaster. And you don't want that because it leads you, let's just say it leads you to a disconnect. It doesn't kill you. It just leads you to a disconnect. One day you wake up and you kind of go, uh, where'd God go? Well, he didn't move. <laughs> we took the fork because it was a good thing. We took the fork. And God's saying, just come back to me. Repent. Humble yourself. Fear me again. Put me in the right place, in the proper place of your life. So I'll ask say um, any questions or comments on. I don't really want you to tell me if you've answered a folly, but we all have. Folly has cried out, and I said, yeah. And so run, run back to God. What was it in uh, Camelot when he wanted to run? They had the young man to run. What are you telling about Camelot? I'll tell you about the place that I was with God. Run, get back there. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And as wisdom cries out, it is the voice of the Holy Spirit for us as Christians. It is that voice of the Holy Spirit that's inside us that speaks to us. But I pray that we load up with the word of God on the inside of us that our soul is being redirected. Not just by the voice of God, but it's through the word and the voice of God speaking to us that we load our soul up. And I thank you for the, the voice. But Lord, I know there's the voice of folly that's always speaking out there. And sometimes she even quietens down a little bit and sounds like she's right. But Lord, I pray that you'll help us to hear the voice of wisdom and to walk in that place with you, only you. And we leave folly behind. And I just pray, Father God, as wisdom cries out even tonight, that you'll grant us the steps that we need to take to walk in your paths of righteousness, which is a path of joy. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings upon you. Shep, thanks for cooking. That was good.